On this week's episode of Physio Foundations, I'm talking to specialist neurological physiotherapist, Professor Prue Morgan, about the foundational knowledge and skills that helped her become an expert neurological physiotherapist. Welcome to the Physio Foundations podcast, the podcast about the knowledge and skills that provide the foundation of expert clinical practice. I'm your host, Luke Periton, and on this episode, I'm joined by Professor Prue Morgan from the Department of Physiotherapy at Monash University. So Prue's a specialist neurological physiotherapist, as recognized by the Australian College of Physiotherapists, and a physiotherapy educator in our Bachelor and Doctor of Physiotherapy courses at Monash Uni, where she teaches the foundational knowledge and skills of neurological physiotherapy. And Prue's also the head of physiotherapy at Monash Uni, and that makes her my boss. So I better try to say. And Prue, thank you for coming on. Uh, welcome to the podcast. Thanks very much for inviting me. Let's start a little bit with your background so the listeners know who you are. I mean, some listeners will know you very well. Others will benefit from a bit of an introduction. And then we'll go into the knowledge and skills that you have and you know what's transferable from neurophysio to other fields and specialties in physiotherapy. So uh, can you tell us a bit, little bit about you first and um, your, I guess, your pathway? We're interested in foundational skills and also the foundations of you know, personal and professional development that experts have built up over the years. So where did you start, you know, from your undergrad training and clinical work, clinical specialization, and finally, where you are now? Sure. So I confess, I was never a sporty child. I never went to a physiotherapist as a child. I played very little sport. So I guess some of the things that attract our students into physiotherapy, they didn't really apply to me. Um, however, I enjoyed working with children. Um, and so I guess initially, paediatric physiotherapy really appealed to me. And so when I graduated, I got my dream job at the Royal Children's Hospital. And after working there for a few years, I did what was very typical at the time. I went overseas uh, to the UK and got several sort of short-term locum positions but, you know, musculoskeletal physio didn't really appeal. I couldn't find a paediatric locum. So I'm thinking, okay, what's left? I figured that uh, neurology was just like sort of big children. Uh, so I, I did several short-term locums in neurology. And then when I came back to Australia again, I then thought, well, I'm into neurology now. And so I then took a position at Royal Melbourne Hospital and, you know, I spent maybe, you know, 20 years then uh, working at Royal Melbourne Hospital and subsequently at Monash Medical Centre in various neurology roles. So you had about 20 years of clinical experience in so peds and, and with adults and then entered academia as a, a highly experienced physio. Yeah, so I think maybe by the time I'd worked for, you know, 20 odd years in clinical practice, I was looking for a new challenge. I really enjoyed um, some of the sort of bedside teaching when we had students through the hospitals. And I thought, oh, maybe I'd move across into academia where, you know, I could perhaps expand and grow my education skills. And so that really prompted my move uh, across into the university world. Yeah, so I'm really interested in a minute and in going into your experience and your, um, your thoughts on physio education all sorts of areas, including neurophysio. Before we go there, though, let's let's go back a step. And can you give us a bit of an overview of what a neurological physio does and the type of people you work with and the types of outcome measures you use and in interventions you do? Yeah, absolutely. So essentially, you could come across a patient who presents with neurological conditions in an acute hospital in a rehabilitation or subacute environment, or maybe in an outpatient clinic. Um, and certainly in Australia, at least, there's a growing number of physiotherapists who also exclusively function in private practices. But the sort of patients typically that you would see may have an acquired neurological condition, such as Parkinson's disease or stroke 
or maybe they've experienced a traumatic brain injury or maybe a spinal cord injury. Similarly, you may end up working with patients who may have a developmental neurological condition, such as cerebral palsy. So they've had it since birth, but perhaps they're now adults and they come to you seeking advice or management of new problems that might arise. Okay, so that gives us a bit of a background of, of what you do. Um, what about, let's go into knowledge and skills of a neurophysio. So you teach in our Bachelor of Physio um, course and the Doctor of Physio course. You've also taught um, clinicians, you know, clinical education. You've, you've taught into the Australian College of Physio um, specialization program. So you've taught people from novice level to experienced level. Um, is there anything in neurological physio that you'd say would be just foundational, fundamental knowledge and skills that you would, you would teach all the time and you'd come back to as a clinician? Yeah, so I think as a neurological physiotherapist, perhaps the most important skill to have is really well-developed observational skills. So being able to look at how a patient moves and have an understanding about is that normal or is that abnormal? And certainly when we teach um, our students at the university, first of all, we very much focus on, well, how do you stand up from a chair? Or how do you roll over in bed? Or how do you balance when you're standing up? And once students have an understanding of what is normal, then they're better able to be able to interpret what they see as I understand that is now abnormal and unpack why is it then abnormal. So we can draw some parallels between what you've just said and other fields of physio, medicine, yep. even coaching, education. So an obvious one would be, you know, if you can understand how to perform an exercise or a sports activity. Yeah, or... I'm sorry, Luke. I've got really heavy rain. Oh, I can't hear it. Melting down. I can hardly hear you. Let me just see if I've got my... Um... Well, we had a, an interruption there in the podcast. We had some very loud hail landing on Prue's roof. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start the conversation again. So we were talking about normal movement and so getting the students to really understand normal movement first and then helping them understand uh, impairments and, yeah. and abnormal movement. And how do you think we could apply that to other areas of physiotherapy? So we're talking about neurological physio today um, or even other areas of medicine. Um, how generalizable is that piece of advice to other types of clinicians or students with other interests outside of yeah, neuro? Yeah, absolutely. I would think that it's very applicable in that if someone, you know, walks in and you observe that they're limping, then you don't just hone in and get the patient up on the plinth and only look at their knee or only look at their hip. You know, you're interested in how does that joint dysfunction impact on the patient's entire, you know, gait pattern or, you know, how does that um, shoulder pain affect their ability to be able to reach up overhead and hang up their washing. Um, so, you know, being able to observe the whole patient is, I would think, a critical component of essentially a large number of physiotherapy uh, approaches. Mm, so important. What other knowledge do you use every day as an educator or as a, a clinician? So I'm thinking everything from neuroanatomy and physiology and pharmacology pathophysiology. Yeah, There's, so there are certainly so many, but what one, do you of, think? Yeah. <laughs> one of the things that I find most interesting about neurological physiotherapy is managing all of the non-motor impairments. And that, for me, is what makes, you know, working with stroke patients or working with patients after um, brain injury uh, so challenging is having an understanding about, oh, okay, wow, they've actually got neglect for that patient, you know, that whole half of their world doesn't exist. So how can I incorporate my motor retraining into sort of managing those sort of um, broader uh, impairments? And, you know, for me, I find that 
fascinating. And I know that a lot of uh, students who might have done uh, perhaps psychology at high school or maybe psychology um, in at university, they, they're also really interested in some of the sort of neuropsychology and how that applies to us in managing our patients. On the last episode, Brian Kim graduated in 2020, one of our grads. He was talking about you know, the new grad experience and he was talking about that exactly that, looking at the whole person from a Musk perspective. Yeah. So you know, with neuro clients and people with neurological problems, there must be a whole new world of, um, of extra layers of complexity there. Yeah, well, you absolutely. And often, yeah, often it's just the, you know, you're, you're seeing a patient for the first time and, and, you know, I often say it's, if, you know, you get that sort of NQR feeling. Something's not quite right. And it's not just explained by their movement or by their motor impairments. And that's where you need to make sure that you've got a really good understanding of neuroanatomy as having a good understanding of neuroanatomy will help you understand some of those particularly non-motor impairments and how they influence function. You mentioned neglect. Tell us about some other non-motor impairments. Yeah. This, so this is a really even, general interest episode for us and we yeah. may in future chats get, dive deeper into some of these problems. Yeah. So, you know, another real challenge when you're working in neurological practice is communication. Many patients with neurological problems have dysphasia. Perhaps they can't understand the words that you're saying to them or they can't express themselves back to you. And so you have to sort of navigate being able to ask your patient, you know, does that hurt? Uh, can you lift your arm up? Uh, can you walk towards me without using words or with using, you know, perhaps gesture or, or just using the, the, the tone of your voice to be able to communicate? And so that, again, is another challenge. Uh, dyspraxia is another non or it's another impairment that significantly influences patients motor behavior uh, so perhaps they may uh, not be able to copy you or imitate you uh, but perhaps they're able to put on their dressing gown but they put it on upside down or inside out and again some of those sort of what I call sort of NQR experiences makes you think oh hang on there's something else going on here that I need to manage and ideally those sorts of more complex presentations are best managed within a team setting so with our colleagues such as occupational therapists or speech pathologists so that you can ensure that you're addressing all of those issues that are impacting on your patient's function so as a neurophysio, you'd spend a lot of time observing movement, normal movement and abnormal movement, and you're thinking about the impairments and functional limitations that may come from that and the effect it may have on a person. Um, you know, considering those non-motor impairments, so neglect and um, dysphagia and dyspraxia and, and other um, impairments you mentioned, and then really it's a, really a role that involves multidisciplinary care and working with uh, other non-physiotherapists, yeah. other Ab members absolutely. of the allied health and medical team. Yeah. So it, look, it's a really interesting overview of neurophysio. Uh, so students and clinicians who are listening to this episode who are interested in teaching, let's talk about education briefly. So um, either as a clinical educator or teaching other clinicians or perhaps teaching at a university. Uh, as a clinician, what are the benefits that they might get from teaching, having a go at teaching? What do you get from teaching other people? And how does it, how does teaching improve your own clinical practice? Yeah, and certainly, you know, ultimately my um, love of teaching drove me into the university. But most of us as clinicians, we do teaching as part of our everyday life, whether you're teaching a nurse how to transfer a patient who's had a stroke from the bed into the wheelchair, or maybe you're teaching uh, a family member how to put on uh, a shoulder support for the hemiplegic upper limb, or maybe, you know, you're working with physiotherapy students, all of those do need uh, teaching skills. And I find it really um, valuable to make sure, to make me reflect on what are the most important things that I need to get across? Or how, how do I best communicate um, those key elements so that 
a novice or a, a family member or maybe a member of another discipline can understand what I'm trying to get them to do or understand, um, you know, how to do a, a task or a, a, a procedure. And certainly when I'm teaching physio students at all levels or even qualified physiotherapists in the specialisation program, it certainly makes me reflect on why, why am I doing, you know, why am I choosing to do the things that I'm choosing to do? What, what is it that is making me make that decision? And certainly as you get more experienced, you know, you sort of run through those options in your mind all the time. If you're deciding on a certain intervention, you're thinking about what would be the best thing for me to do. And so it's allowing students or junior practitioners to be able to sort of come with you on that journey and try something, be able to evaluate, actually, that didn't work. I'm going to try something else. And, oh, that did work. And, again, getting them better at self-reflection and self-evaluation so that they can improve in their practice. And Pete Maliaris and I talked about that on his episode a couple of episodes ago yeah. about the, the importance of reflection and being critical of your own practice. So listeners can go back and have a listen to that. It was a really good, really good conversation with Pete. Um, so you, and your love of teaching, a passion for teaching really shines through as you start to speak. And um, I'm sure that the students really, um, really appreciate that. And that sort of fosters some um, real interest in the topic in them as well. So, so what about clinicians who are currently working and they're perhaps working in neurological physio or another field of physio? It doesn't matter what field they're in. What sort of a pathway are what sort of pathways are available for clinicians if they're interested in education or research and they're currently only doing clinical practice, but they want to broaden what they're doing? From your yeah, experience, so certainly, yeah, there are there are lots of of options. I mean, I would imagine um, many. Clinicians may well um, be linked in with a university or maybe multiple universities, and through those universities, they may have an opportunity to enhance their educator skills through clinical educator workshops. Um, because of COVID, there are now lots of uh, online clinical educator workshops that um, phys uh, that uh, physios may be interested in exploring. And also, of course, the Australian Physio Association has an educator uh, special interest group. And again, as educators, they, you know, offer uh, online lectures or, you know, uh, courses, short courses that allow practitioners to be able to upskill in education. So there are lots of options for, for students, uh, for uh, practitioners. And I would also suggest that, you know, amongst yourselves, maybe in your, um, uh, at your employer, or maybe if you work in a big hospital, again, there may well be opportunities for you to, um, to put together uh, short courses, or maybe even, you know, journal clubs, where it allows you to provide, you know, some stimulation of ideas. I guess that's the best thing about physio is, it certainly has never stood still. So the sorts of things that I'm doing today, they're not actually exactly the same as what I did when I graduated a long time ago. And that's what's so exciting about physio, that we're continuing to move forward and advance our practice. Mm, absolutely. And you, you don't necessarily have to choose something straight out of university and say, I'm going to be doing this field and I'm going to, then I'm going to be doing a you know, formalised research, training and, and teaching. As you said, there's bits and pieces of education that you can do. A lot of them are proactive. You can come up with your own uh, workplace education in, in services and you know, be a part of groups, clinical education workshops. So um, there's lots of opportunities to develop the teaching and research side if you're a clinician. Uh, I would really like to talk to you again about, I've got some, I would really like to dive into your um, specialty in another episode in cerebral palsy, cerebral palsy and falls in balance. We've got so much I want to talk to you about, but we're going to leave it there. Where can people go to read or find out more about you and your work, Churchill Fellowship, perhaps we can talk about that in a future episode, um, and what you do. 
And what's some what's some yeah. resources you could direct people to? Uh, so certainly if they're interested in reading about my research or even maybe my Churchill Fellowship report, um, you can just Google me, uh, Prue Morgan Churchill Fellowship, if you want to read about that, or uh, Prue Morgan Cerebral Palsy. And again, a lot of my publications pop up on that. Or if you want to know a little bit more about my role within the university, then um, you can just Google Prue Morgan Monash University and uh, have a look at the information that's online. You have done a lot. So we have a lot to talk about in the future, but that was a really nice overview. I hope it gave the listeners a little bit of a, uh, an insight into what a neurological physio does and, you know, and highlighted your passion for teaching. And we've just, we touched on some of the research that you've done. Perhaps we can talk about that in the future. Um, thanks very much, Prue. I know you're really busy. You've got teaching, heavy teaching next week with our physio students because um, you're heavily involved in that as well as running the department. So you're super busy. But I do, do appreciate your time. Thanks for your support of this podcast and this series. Um, as it gets going, we'll chat again. But for now, thanks okay. very much, Prue. All right. Thanks, Luke. 